Hi, I'm Dina Chavin, and this is The You in Human. After spending many years, many, many years, you know, being really stubborn about my own personal opinions and believing that the ways that I thought about the way life is supposed to work, and after spending years doing that, I realized that the only person that is going to suffer and feel pain through all of that is me. And recently, I've come to understand that our role as human beings is to evolve past what we know to allow us to get into a different space where we are living from a place of consciousness to be able to react and behave from choice and not just reaction to the things around us because of the triggers that we have. I also believe that the ways with which we evolve as human beings is through our environment and through our relationships, whether it's your relationship with your parents, whether it's your relationship at work or with your friends, the only way that we can actually really have healthy relationships is through evolving becoming more introspective and kind of understanding who we are as people so that we can always be able to give back to the people around us in very healthy dynamics in a way that serves us, not in a way that allows us to suffer. And that's something that I learned after years of being stubborn and after years of believing that I was always right in certain situations, I realized that when I the only time I was able to really kind of live a healthier life with the kinds of friends that kind of, you know, we actually helped each other evolve is when I was kind of able to admit the times when I was wrong and, and recognize in the times that I was right and then be able to resolve conflict in a healthy manner. One of the main ways that we can also evolve and that people tend to kind of soar in is, is the times that, you know, we're around younger children. Because children allow us to kind of take a mirror and look at ourselves to recognize who we really are, to be able to become the best versions of who we are, to be able to have healthier relationships with these children. And so our guest today is one of the dearest people to my heart. She is a psychologist and she has gone through, gone through her own uh, journey of evolution to get her to where she is right now, to be able to live a happier, healthier life with her own environment, and then also find a way to empower other people to do the same. Today we have Amina Dieb. Hi, Amina. Thank you so much for being here with me. And I'm so excited to start navigating this conversation with you. <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs> so the first thing I wanted to ask you, it's not the first thing, but one of the things I really wanted to kind of talk to you about was, so there's Amina the psychologist, there's Amina the mother, and then there's Amina. Hmm. Do you feel like when you kind of step into the role of, of my mom, you, people just see you as that? Or do they see you as the whole you and everything that's you? Because I feel like a lot of the times mothers tend to fall into the space where people just see them as the mom. And I can imagine, because they have this entire world that that's who they were for the most part prior to being a mom, I can imagine that can get quite frustrating. And I've had a lot of my friends come and tell me like, I'm so much more than just a mom, you know? like. Being a mom is a huge thing, but I'm all these other things. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like you have that happening with you? Um, I feel like I'm so much because I'm a mom. Amazing. If that makes any sense. Yeah. I don't know if I, like, I feel like because I was, a, I am a mom and because I was a very young mom, mm. it has allowed me to be, become so much. Mm. Uh, I think that would be my answer. Definitely. Do you want me to get into details? Yeah, because like I've never heard that before. Actually, I've uh, never heard someone respond like that. That's amazing. I feel like I feel like because I'm a mom and because I was a mom at a, such a young age, I've been given the room to um, be more nurturing to not only my children and my family, but also my group of friends that are also becoming new moms. Mm. I'm, and I'm not coming, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not entering the, the, their world with the, oh, listen, I'm the parenting expert that you should know, but hey, listen, I, I've done this and, and I can show you and I can help you and I understand what you're going through because I was there too, but just yeah. much younger. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And I feel like uh, I've learned so much from being a young mom that it has given me the room and space to um, learn more about myself. Yeah. And had I not had that specific journey in that specific way in that specific time, I don't think I would have been able to reach so far personally yeah. um, and get where I am right now. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Because I actually realized there's a lot of people that are always in that space feeling very frustrated. And I think a lot of the... So like I feel like our 
pain and our suffering, not the pain. The suffering comes from the resistance to the circumstance. Mm. And then I think a lot of the times women tend to feel like if I become a mom, that's all I'm going to be. And I'm not going to be who I actually obviously intended to be, but that changes as we go along. And then there's this worry constantly of like people just see me as the mom mm. and I'm all these other things as well. But it's so beautiful that you say I've become so, I've become incredible because I'm a mom. I, and I agree. I feel like we have this negative association with being a mom. And, and it's just that, oh, you're just a mom. You know, I feel like when in fact it's the exact opposite. I feel like, and I, the way I see it truly is when, you know, becoming a mother, you, you've, you've become this superpower, this superwoman, this, 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 you know, your body has actually created a human being inside it and you're capable of doing so much and so many things at the same time. And, and I, I, I feel like I, I see it differently. Um, well, maybe I've taught myself to see it differently, but I feel like it's a compliment when someone says, oh, wow, you're a mom and you do that and you do this. Oh, wow. Or, oh, wow, you're a mom. You have two kids and you're bring, you're raising them in the best way you know how. That that on its own is huge. Yeah, that's amazing. Because I think I had that actually, that problem. I think I rejected this idea of like being a mom for the longest time because I felt like, especially in my 20s, I think, I felt like if I became a mom that that's all I was ever going to be. And I had all these dreams and these plans of things that I wanted to do with my mm. life. And like, I'm just like, no, not now. Because if I do that, then my life ends. Yeah. And I think it's like growing into understanding that it's like a transition, but also it's a continuation. Mm. It's not like something stops and then something new begins. It's a continuation and an evolution of who we are as human yeah. beings. Because we also evolve through our relationships. You yes. can't evolve just sitting alone for the rest yes. of your life. Like people have to like push you and trigger you. Yeah. And like you have to you learn a lot about yourself which will teach you how to rise above who you are to become a different person, to make your relationships thrive. And I think one of the ways that we majorly end up evolving is through having children. And if I can just add to that, I feel like becoming a mom, if you're present enough in the times that you are, I feel like it also really pokes at your inner child and it allows your inner child to come out and play too. Yes. <laughs> and when it does for me, I feel like it's, 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 a, it's a really um, refreshing feeling to just go back and, and, and find that piece of yourself coming out again and just really enjoying yourself out in this world again. And, and, and I feel like a lot of moms can resonate with that. That's, Sometimes our kids bring, do they, they, they poke us and they trigger us, but they do bring out a lot of, uh, they bring out the best in us. And then they make you like feel alive again. Like you are allowed to be your silly self around them because you have yeah. a child nearby. Yes. And it's like they give you the permission to do the things you always wanted to do, you know? And that's such a blessing to be able to have. Like I love that's being so around true. kids because I can dance anywhere 100%. and nobody will ever say anything to me because <laughs> it's okay. You have a child with you. Actually, I thought one of your questions that you were going to ask and I had the the answer already prepared in my head was if you're not a mom what are you and I think I'm still a child like yeah. that's how I still see myself as this little you know eight chubby year old <laughs> still playing and you know dancing in the background you know this is how I see myself I, I still see myself as a child and I and I love it when that child inner child of me comes out and plays and but I see that, that with you like yeah. you're so full of life and you're always dancing yeah. about and you're always giving other people permission to do that just by your presence, which is just so incredible. And I know people, everybody's longing for that. Everyone's longing to bring that part out. A lot of people have stuffed it down and forgotten it mm. because the rules are if you're in Walls and walls yeah. and barriers and yeah. conditioning and... And to protect yourself and to save yourself and mm -hmm. all of that and preserve yourself. But I think in reality that you are most alive when you are most in touch with your energy. Yes. That's very true. Because like that was always the one thing because Hatta was like, I realized I'm the kind of person people love to come and have conversations with and talk about this stuff, right? About anything that would do with anything emotional. And I love to hear it. But then I realized like I, one, I didn't have boundaries for Kutuba Khali had and like I obviously zero understanding of how to not let it come into here and then mm -hmm. I become that and then I got to a point where like I, once I started becoming in tune with like my own emotions and people's energies and I was aware of it like very damaging and I because I don't have the tools for how to separate I end up having to slowly just put boundaries until I felt like I was in a space where I now know how to take that in but without letting it penetrate me yeah. and like offer yeah. that advice, they leave and like they haven't left their energy as well. Mm -hmm. So what did you do? 
uh, so I went back to my therapist, I went back to my supervisor and I'm letting them know like, okay guys, so <laughs> I'm experiencing the symptoms that my clients are saying in the therapy room, what's going on? And I wasn't expecting this and they're like, okay, you've, you're taking too much of the same type of clients. You need to start differentiating shwaya, you need to start learning to say no, you need to start having kid and, and learning to say no, I think it's probably one of, I'm still learning to say no. We all are, it's so hard. Uh, <laughs> Especially I'm, when you're genuinely doing something you love and you want to do it to help other people. And you genuinely know that you can help. Yeah. It's like you have a tool that I, I can just, I can, I can help you yeah. right now, like within the next week, but. Yeah. It's not, I, if I help you, I, I'm not helping myself to continue helping other people. Aywa. And it's like, I really, I realize like it's so challenging because you then get to a point because we feel this had to just through, I think through any industry where you're genuinely, where your job is about helping other people, right? Mm -hmm. Where you're offering something that of your knowledge to help make their lives healthier and have better quality and like better like relationships in, in general, better relationship with themselves. Anytime you feel like, oh my God, I have this really small tool. I know if you just sit with me for 10 minutes, I'd be able to do that. But when you do so much of that, mm. you get into a space where you're completely drained mm. and then you actually have nothing else to offer. Wala offer yourself, wala your kids, wala your husband, wala the community. And then just on the quality of whatever you're offering is just so half-hearted. Yeah. And then you're not even able to, I realized with me, I didn't have the clarity that I normally have with mm -hmm. them to be able to offer them what, so, they, uh, yeah. what they needed. So what did you do? Like, um, So my supervisor at the time had told me something. Um, she's like a supervisor, a mentor. She's a she means a lot to me. You hear she's here in Egypt. Oh, I was lucky enough to have to, you know, we crossed paths really early on when I was still in uni. And then uh, so she, she told me something that really helped me to detach from this feeling or emotion or what I was experiencing, which was, to say to myself when I'm experiencing that anxiety is to say, wow, so this is how my client felt when she was discussing or telling or explaining to me what she was saying in the therapy room. So this is how I felt, wow, she must be going through a lot. Mm. So this helped me detach Shwaya, like this is not, this is not mine. Yeah. This is my client's emotions and feelings being projected onto me. Mm. And I had to learn to like slowly give it back to them and not take it in. But yeah, no, mm. that makes any sense. Actually, so this is <laughs> interesting. So my sister actually was teaching me about this a couple of years ago. This concept of sometimes when you end up just feeling bad out of nowhere, how do you differentiate between when something is yours and when you picked up something else? Ashen Bordu, I feel like with like, for example, I'm someone who feels very deeply. So I feel other people's emotions. And so sometimes I'll pick something up from my mom or I'll pick something mm. up from my friend. Or I'll pick something from my sister. <laughs> and then I always thought it was mine. And then I would feel really bad. I'd sit mm. with it. And it, sometimes it would last for days and I wouldn't know how to navigate it. Eventually it would go away. And I wouldn't even know it was us and someone else's. Yeah. So how do you know, like, when it's your emotion? And then how do you know when it belongs to someone else? And then what do you do about it? I feel like it's if you are someone that regularly checks in with yourself and you just kind of like, you know, it's almost as if you're watching a movie, but your movie is yours and you're just playing back what happened today. Okay, so I went for coffee and then I met this friend and then I did this and then I went to work and then I came back and I worked out. How am I feeling right now? Why am I feeling what I'm feeling? Is it is it because I did too much? Is it because I did too little? Who did I see? What did they say? Is it affecting how I feel right now? And I, th I feel like having that regular check-ins with yourself at the end of the day or maybe in the beginning of the day really helps a lot. Mm -hmm. And again, tr kind of uh, uh, something that has helped me is to just, you know, reflect back as if you're watching your life as a movie. Okay. So, so you're kind of like the observer. It helps you see things more objectively than very especially if you feel like you're you're not able to differentiate between is this me that's feeling this or is that their feeling and then I've manifested it as my own. It just it helps you really to just detach when you play the observer mm. of your own movie. <laughs> so I was reading this book a while ago and um, he was talking a lot about this concept of, he's not a psychologist or anything, but he's like this incredibly profound human being and he was saying 
you are not the voice, you are the observer、mm. of the voice.、Mm. Like, because the voice that we hear inside of our head is the sound of years of other people's opinions、mm. of us. There are years of like, you know, what you see through the media, what you see through your own culture, what your parents have said to you. And you, a lot of the times, when we're hearing a voice in our head telling us something, it's not actually our own voice because it's just noise inside of our head. And he was saying, like, a lot of the times, like, when we get triggered by something, you're getting triggered by something you've stuffed down that's happened years in the past that you're not actually reacting to something happening. Right now,、mm-hmm. because if you were, you wouldn't just be triggered by it, you wouldn't be just reacting it because you're either in reaction or you're in choice.、Mm. So, then I guess my question is because this is something I learned to do over many, many, many years, and it was really exhausting, and I learned it the hard way. How do you then differentiate between your own inner voice and the voice inside your head? Yeah. I love that question because I think it relates a lot to Bardu, the way we parent our kids. And I'm going to bring it back to that Please, because yeah, that's, that's, what I, yeah, that's what I that's what I, that's what I know. A lot, and I love to speak a lot about this topic、Amazing. because a, a lot of parents end up saying to themselves, I shouldn't be doing this, I should be doing that.、Yeah. But I shouldn't be raising that way, I should be doing that.、Mm. And what they don't realize, is, which is exactly what you're saying, is that. This should and shouldn't is, is the culmination of so many years of conditioning that we've been exposed to. So, conditioning from our parents, from society, from our culture.、Um, and so, when is it? Your question is when, when should we listen to our inner voice? What is our inner voice yeah, telling us?、Yeah. And how do we differentiate between that and the conditioning? And I like to daiman, yani, ask parents to. Catch themselves while they're, you know, just in the middle of that thought process. You know, when they say, My child shouldn't be eating this,、mm-hmm. or my child shouldn't be staying up this late, or my child shouldn't be uh, 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 pl- not playing any sports, they should be playing a thousand things to fill their day. I like to ask them to ask themselves, According to who?、Yeah. According to whom?、Mm-hmm. Who is dictating this should and shouldn't?、Yeah. Is it according to because the trainer said, to, what, do you, what does your heart say?、Yeah. <laughs> you know, what, what do you want?、Yeah. What, does, what does it feel right for you? What、yeah. feels right for you? What feels right for your child? What do you want?、Yeah. And, and, I, and, it, and I think it's hard, Taban, that question is easier said than done,、mm-hmm. to, to remove all this, these layers of conditioning. But I think that's a really good place to start. According to whom? Who am I basing my shoulds and shouldn'ts on? Yeah. Because I think as well, like, There's so much noise on the outside. And I think a lot of the times with parents, right? I, I, you know, I, we now know as adults that our parents did the best they could with the knowledge and the tools they had at the time, right? As adults, we can kind of take a step back and realize what worked, what didn't. I wish they had done this. I wish they had done that. And it's a thing of kind of understanding, like maybe they thought that worked at the time, but how do I then come to realize what works for me now? You know, like, How do you get into a space where you recognize that what worked back then doesn't necessarily work now? And then, how do I then make decisions about what actually works for my child? You know, I know that's a very broad question. Oh, we. And it's a very challenging question, but I know a lot of parents are struggling with that because what I hear a lot from like new moms and new parents is like, I don't want to mess this up. Like,、mm-hmm. I really want to make sure that I don't transfer my own trauma onto my child. So, Like, if someone was to go about trying to figure out how to navigate that, what, it, what is it that they would do? Like, how do they then learn to step outside of themselves in something that's so personal and so close and so emotional to always kind of make a decision that isn't tainted and covered with that trauma?、Mm. I love your questions. <laughs> <laughs> Because then I, there are things like、I'll, I think about, like, I currently don't have kids, but I think about these things.、Yeah. And I talk to my sister a lot, I talk to my friends a lot. Some of them have kids, some of them don't. And those are all things that、mm-hmm. like, we think about because, like, for example, like, I'm super close to my sister's kid, and sometimes like, I watch her as like, a, now a human being, and she'll say things back to me that like, I was like, I just learned this last year. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Here yeah. I am in my 30s.、Yeah. And she'll ask questions that I won't necessarily have answers to, and I'll say, Listen, I don't, I know, what I learned to do is say, I don't have an answer, I'll get back to you,、mm-hmm. I'll think about it. But I, I then always have to make sure that the answers that I'm giving to her are not covered with trauma. 
that are just actually objective answers and answers that are doing justice to who she is, mm-hmm. not based on my own opinions. My yeah, opinion. yeah. So then, how do you go to how do you begin to navigate that as a parent? Is there a way to do that to begin with, or is it something you even have to just kind of figure out as you go along? I think there's no manual or no right or wrong answer to your question. Okay. Uh, but I do believe in one thing. I do believe that if we allow ourselves to be more fluid. If we are allow ourselves to be continuously learning more about ourselves, yeah. more about our children, I feel like you're definitely on the right track. I feel like just holding on to um, ideas or holding on to certain concepts that we feel like should be is what really limits us to really experiencing or evolving or growing as parents. Mm. Um, and it hinders our children at the same time as well. So I think um, just constantly, you know, be a lifelong, lifetime learner. Yeah. And and learning doesn't mean, oh, you have to take this course and you have to do the same thing well and good if you do. Yeah. But learning sometimes means, you know what, I'm just going to sit and observe my child today. What what are their preferences? What do they like to do? What 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 are their interests? What what isn't at all? And learn more about yourself. As in, watch when do your emotions rise? When do your emotions? When do you feel calm? When can you do more of that thing that makes you feel calm? Why are your emotions rising? What can you do about that? So continuously learning about yourself and your child would probably be the best thing you can do as a parent. Yeah, it's really interesting because I I feel like. With having children, this is what I feel, obviously. Again, I don't have kids, so here I am just kind of understanding human patterns. But you have babies. Yes, yes I do. do. <laughs> These are your babies. So, like, <laughs> but also, I understand, like, for to a very large extent, like human behaviors and human patterns. And I think a lot of the times, like, having children and being a good parent, a really big part of it is us working on ourselves yeah. as human beings and having to work on constantly evolving in who we are to always be able to make sure that we're not just reacting th- to things, that we're having conversations and making decisions based on choice, not on triggers. And I think, how do you, like as a parent, right? What can you do to prepare to be a parent? Because I also kind of believe, you know, we study to become doctors, we study to get jobs, we study to go to university. But when it comes to becoming parents, maybe we're not encouraged to do the work leading up to being a parent to at least understanding ourselves a little bit better so that when we make decisions, we're not just making mindless decisions. How do we prepare to do that? And then while we're in it, then what can we do every single day to for ourselves to make sure that we're making kind of the best decisions. Hmm. You know, it's funny that you say that because I wasn't really prepared when I became okay. a parent at all. I was a parent at 22. It oh just it hit me by surprise. Uh, so it's funny now. I guess the word is not funny. It's interesting that um, I'm now res- answering your question, but n- definitely not out of experience. <laughs> uh, it's out of, I guess, more of... I'll give you a textbook answer, not my own personal experience. Uh, and I, I, I feel like you could never be too prepared. And I, and, I, and I see this a lot with a lot of parents that are trying to over-prepare, that sometimes it causes them a bit of uh, worry or anxiety or that sense of I'm not doing enough or I'm doing it wrong because of they're over-read or they're over-googling or they're over-searching. Uh, so I think the best thing, as you said, you've already, I think, gave the answer yourself, which is to heal and work on yourself and your own personal trauma so that you just don't pass it on to your kids. Yeah. And then from that, I think by healing and working on yourself, you also create an intention or more of an, an, an idea of what you want to your, you know, the, the upbringing of your child to look like. Okay. It gives you either a sense of, okay, I definitely don't want that for my child. So you have a sense of more of, okay, I know what what you know what's the direction i'm going for or it makes you sometimes feel like okay i want to do exactly what i experience i want them to experience what i experienced um depending on so i don't think there is i don't think there's a right answer for this uh okay so you said you got married you got you had kids at 22. i didn't know that so now i guess my now i have a question (laughs) um what was that like Uh, like really what was that like I feel like it, I was completely taken by surprise. It wasn't, 
it wasn't part of the plan. And I'm the type that I like to have my plans, you know, all set and ready. And, and, and I've, you know, I have, I, as I was saying, I was very rigid as to how I, I wanted my life to play out. And having a baby at 22 wasn't in my calculations. <laughs> um, it's, it's the best thing that happened to me, actually. Really? Did you feel that at the time? Um, at the time, I felt a huge like surge of emotions. Yeah. There was love, but there was also confusion. There was despair. There was feeling that this huge, huge uh, overshadowing and overpowering emotion of loneliness. Yeah. Um, but now looking back, I'm so happy it played out that way because had I not had my child at 22, everything else wouldn't have followed the way it did. Mm -hmm. And, and it played out so beautifully. I mean, that's how I see it now. Mm. How did you see it, Saita, at the time? Uh, I'm getting into this because I know a lot of people have also experienced So Saita, I felt like it was, it was, it was like a, it was a, my life stopped. Mm. Like, <clears throat> I remember telling myself, it's okay. You're gonna, the plan's still there. Don't worry, don't panic. The plan, <laughs> we're on track. Yeah, <laughs> we're just gonna have to pause for a few years, but the plan's still there. Yeah. So I remember just feeling, um, I feeling like my life was on pause. Okay. Um, but that's only because I was really holding on to what I thought my life should look like, mm. or what I, and I was really holding on to the Amina that's not the parent. Mm. The old Amina. Mm. And, and I think this is something a lot of new parents experience, mm. but it's not something that is really spoken of enough, yeah. which is that mourning of the person that you were before you become, became a parent. Yes. I, yeah. feel like, I feel like because it's almost like it's that person, some people see it that way, that... Now that I'm a parent, I can't do this anymore. Now that I'm a parent, I can't do that anymore. That person or that, that these aspects of my life or my personality no longer exists. Yeah. Who I was is dead. Oh. Now I have something. Now I have to figure out who, who I am with this child yeah. <laughs> that, I, that only relies on me. Yeah. It's very confusing. And I think that's why a lot of new parents go through this existential, almost like crisis of... How am I defining myself now? And, and I don't think we give them enough time to really mourn or, or, or say goodbye to that person that was, mm. and then learn to recreate who they are now. And they don't really have to say goodbye to that person that was. That person was still does exist. Yeah. It's just evolved into this beautiful thing that, can, that has now created a human being. Yeah and can now take care of another human being besides yourself. I think it's, um, I feel like in, I think it's the world actually, it's not just our culture. Like there's, it's like so, such a given that like, you know, you grow up, you go to university, you finish university, if you go, and then you have kids and you have a family and then you move on. But I, I think like what you were saying, and I think this is what's so important. And this is why this sit down with you was so important is like so many changes are happening. And it's like, yes, a not natural part of that, evolution of humanity but I think it's something that so needs to be discussed because yeah. it's like a parent for the first time is a parent for the first time like there's no manual for like how mm -hmm. to do this and like they've never done this before and how do they yeah. do this and like how do you then get into a situation where like let's all talk about it is it okay to talk about it because I realize as well a lot of the times you know our parents and the community and the world what's the big deal like mm -hmm. everyone is a parent everyone has kids what's the problem and that transition can be very, I think, lonely, like you were saying. I think it's very huge to navigate. And you never know, like, what emotions are okay to feel. Because should I be feeling this or should I not be feeling this? And we never know how to do any of that, you know? And I think it's so important to be able to have these conversations openly, yes. to discuss these kinds of things. Because, like, for example, when you have mothers going through something called postpartum depression, right? right? Nobody knows what that is. Yeah. And I know a lot of my friends that have gone through it have gotten to a space where I had a friend who said she was actually very suicidal. Mm. I had another friend that said she just didn't want the babies, like was rejecting it. And it yeah. wasn't like a thing of like, this is not how I actually feel, but I can't help how I feel, you know? And when women, for example, come to you and, and 
maybe they don't know that they have postpartum depression. Like, how do you help them navigate through that? And then do you then talk to the entire family? What do you do? How does that happen? How does that work? So postpartum depression is very close to my heart because I experienced it myself. Okay, when you were 22? When I was 22. No. Yeah. Um, I'm saying it with a smile now, but it wasn't actually <laughs> very happy back then. Uh, and that's actually one of the reasons, and that's why I'm, I keep saying, I feel like this experience for me was a blessing in disguise because had I not experienced that at that age, at that specific time, I wouldn't be wanting to help other moms also experiencing postpartum depression and, and, and basing a lot of what I do uh, because of that experience. Yeah. Um, so... I think, first of all, awareness is really important. I, at the time, despite having, you know, I was a student of child psychology. I was, you know, I had all my, I, I felt like I knew my stuff. I was getting into this um, new experience, even though it wasn't planned, as with like full confidence, you know, like I, I know how to deal with kids. I know all the developmental stages to expect. I know <clears throat> all the milestones that they're supposed to reach. You know, I, I, I have my research done. Mm. But then I was, I felt like I was hit by a bus with, with, with this postpartum depression because I didn't even read about my own mental health. I didn't read about what I would be experiencing, what I would be going through, which I feel like a lot of us do when we come to, uh, when we want to prepare ourselves when becoming parents, we read about the baby. Yeah. Because that's what we, we don't know and we want to know more about. Um, but we don't, we don't focus on ourselves at all. And I think... I think awareness is the first thing. If we need to be aware that postpartum depression, which is as soon as you, after you give birth, um, you do feel a list of symptoms which then needs to be clinically diagnosed as postpartum depression if they persist over three to six months. What did it feel like for you? <sighs> for me, I was, I, I don't think, um, I wasn't clinically diagnosed, but I knew. Um, For me, I didn't, it's not that I didn't want my child. I was just constantly sad. I loved him. I wanted him to be with me, but I wanted him to be with me as I cried my heart out morning night. Mm. It was, it was, it was very, it was very confusing because I was so happy and I was grateful and I was excited and I was, and I, and I did love my baby, which I feel very lucky to have felt because I know a lot of people with postpartum depression don't, no. that, that, that rush of emotions doesn't kick in until much later. But I was just sad the whole time. I was crying the whole time. Mm. And I felt like, I think the, the overpowering emotion was alone. I felt so alone. Did you feel alone because... I, mean, I don't know, but Saita at the time, did people just not like know what that was as well? And then you didn't know what it was and like... like I didn't know what it was. I don't think the people around me understood what it was. Uh, we, I, even though they were very supportive. Yeah, but I think... They just don't know what's going uh, on. I don't think... I don't think I... I don't think they understood what I was experiencing. Um, and I think Bordeaux, I was the only one... I was the first of my group of friends to give birth early, to have a baby, to start a family. So the people that I would generally lean on didn't understand either. Mm. Um, I think I think this is where feeling alone felt, yeah. came from. Uh -uh. I think that must have felt awful mm. you know, because you're stepping into this new world, this new role, and you're feeling something you've never felt before, but you still are the person that this new being is completely dependent on and you have to show up for that being in the best way that you can but you can't show up in the best yeah. way that you can and then i think one of the worst feelings is to have something feel like it's wrong and then not know what it is or what to do and i <clears throat> and and i think that's and i think it's even though the people around me didn't really understand what i was experiencing i was very lucky to have them um, still be extremely supportive yeah. and I and 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 I don't know I don't know if I would have been able to come out the other side the way uh, the way I did or as quickly as I did mm -hmm. had I not had the people around me uh, supporting me yeah. um, I remember my mom for example she walked in on me once uh, and I was again as uh, breastfeeding crying She looked at me and then she, she's, she's doing the best she can with the knowledge she has, okay? So she's seeing this scene of me uh, trying to breastfeed my child as I cry my, my heart out, uh, my baby being extremely fussy because 
I, I, I'm still learning to feed him, so I'm crying, he's crying, uh, trying to breastfeed, feeling anxious. And I remember her saying, uh-uh, no. Yeah, get up, pack your bag, we're gonna get out of here, we're gonna change your environment, let's go. At the time it was uh, summer, summer, so Sahel season. <laughs> Yalla, we're gonna go. I, we're, every day you're gonna be looking at the beach. You're gonna be, you know, feeling the wind and the sand and the sea. You're gonna change your environment. Yalla, get up. Let's go. Let's go. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and that was really helpful. Mm. I know. I know it's not what we would call support today, Loa. We would sit and validate yeah. your feelings, but that was still really helpful. And she helped in the way she could, which was extremely supportive. Yeah. Um, my yeah, husband on the other side. didn't she like leave you alone? Like, no. She's like, okay, let's go. I'll she's she's I can, like, I'll do what I can. Yalla, get up. <laughs> uh, and saying. my husband on the other side, on the other hand, um, was really helpful emotionally mm. and pragmatically too. Yeah. Like it was a bit of both. So he saw me, he's like, and he knows my plan. <laughs> I've shared with him my plan. He knows how my life should have played out. So so he's 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 honoring that. So he's like, I remember so well, I was crying. He's like, I had just put the baby to sleep. And then he's like, I'm gonna come, let's go outside. Let's sit in the living room. He's like, get a pen and paper. I'm like, okay, sure. <laughs> Got my pen and paper. I'm like, what are we doing? He's like, all right, R write down what you're gonna do tomorrow. He's like, I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, write down what you're gonna do tomorrow. I'm like, I'm not gonna do anything tomorrow. He's like, that's not true. Mm -hmm. Write down what you're gonna do tomorrow. And then I started writing down, I'm gonna wake up, the baby, I'm gonna feel, I started writing things. He's like, okay, I need you to take them. Every time we do it, I need you to cross it out. So you know that actually you're doing a lot. And I started, I'm like, and I wrote that. I ended up writing a list of 20 things that I had to do for the baby. I had to change diapers. I had to go buy this. And he's like, okay, every time you finish one of them, you cross it out because I need you to see yeah. that you're actually doing a lot. Yeah. And then he's like, flip the paper. I'm like, again? He's like, he's like, now I want you to write down what you want to do in two months and three months. Go back to your plan. What's your plan? He's like, remember that plan <laughs> that we talked about before you got What's your plan? Write it down. What are we going to do? I'm like, and then I remember I'm feeling, Khalas, my, like, my life, there's a pause, there's yeah. a stop because we, baby, he's like, that's not true. Where's, where's your master's? What are you going to do? I'm like, I can't travel. He's like, no, but you can do it online. Yalla, write it down. Where are you going to, where are you going to apply? Where are you going to, where's your essay? Where's, how are you going to, uh, you know, how are you going to um, do all the, it's my a sign sign up I'll register start registering to things see what you where you're going to get accepted to yalla keep going mm -hmm. where's your plan and that was so helpful so did you feel your energy shift as you were doing that exercise at the time yeah uh, no, I, I remember like thinking like, why do I have to do this? <laughs> oh, okay. But uh, the next day when I was ticking off, you felt it. I'm like, oh, okay. Now I, I see. I, like I know, I know why he told me to do that. And like my life actually has meaning. No, no, it really, it really felt. I, I like. I think that was for me um, a very important moment in my life. Yeah. Because it just, I think it just taught me to. Well, and lean on the uh, on the people that love you. Yeah. Because they they they're there for you. You don't have to close on yourself and and feel isolated. And it taught me that. And there will always be at least one person. Like, will, even if will. you don't have even, an entire family network, we always have at least one person that will help us. And they will help in the way that they know how. Yeah, that's really important. And that's something important to understand. Mm -hmm. My mom, she just, she, she, just, she, she wasn't, um, I wouldn't say she wasn't, she was more very, um, she was, it's so hard to talk about, you know, what she is and isn't. <laughs> That's hard to say about your parents because yeah, you love them regardless. Yeah. But I guess what she gave me was something that I maybe I didn't know I needed at the time. Yeah. I thought I needed help in a certain way, but she gave it to me in another way. Yeah. So just being open to the type of help you're receiving yeah, yeah. Is, 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 is important. Yeah. Um, oh, and Bardo, this experience taught me to be fluid. Remember when I said not to be so rigid with how you think you should yeah. be or or how life should have been. Uh, just be more khalas. Okay, so this is it. Yeah. This is what, where we're at. Yeah. What are we going to do about it? Because I realize as well, a lot of the times, like every time I have a plan and I become obsessed with sticking to that plan, mm. one, you'll always be disappointed because life never works out exactly the way you want. Life works out the way you need. Yeah. So whatever happens to you is always for the best. And even when challenging experiences or experiences that we feel are absolutely horrible, 
we go through them. It's for our evolution, for our growth every single time. Mm -hmm. And it's always just about like how we see these things, right? Yeah. And every time I've become obsessed with the life that I planned and the plan has to go yeah. exactly according to it. One, it disappoints because it never works. It rarely works out the way you plan for mm -hmm. it. And then two, it's always like something so much more extraordinary comes out of it if 100%. I just allow myself to surrender to what to how God orchestrates life. And to see it, because sometimes you do surrender, but you don't allow yourself to see, to see how valuable that change or experience yeah. is for you. Yeah. I actually heard something recently and they were, you know, because some people always say things like, you know, I am, to, I, I am talking to God, but he's not answering. And the reality is he's always answering, but are we listening? Like, mm -hmm. Are we willing to receive? It, the answer is always there. And every time you ask a question, it comes in some form. Sah. But are we in a space where we're willing to, to be receive. open? and willing to receive it and willing to allow God to create a life for us that's like extraordinary because part of it is us making a plan and setting the intention and saying, this is what I want in general and then allowing it to happen in the time Mm -hmm. that's best for you mm -hmm. in the way that's best for you yeah. and learning to accept it. I remember so many times where like I became obsessed with the thing and then it didn't happen and then I fell into this miserable, horrible state of despair and depression and everything is horrible and life is against me and God mm -hmm. doesn't listen to me and God doesn't love me. And like when I finally got through that because I was using really poor language with myself, like mm -hmm. internally in my head, it was just a disaster. And then two, I wasn't allowing myself to actually just be open to the fact that I don't know everything. Po it's yeah. possible <laughs> yeah. yeah and i don't have all the answers because to even say that is so arrogant of yeah. us right and that's our ego like wanting to know that like it can do everything properly and then just recognizing that i don't have all the answers i don't know what's best for me a lot of the time and when i go inwards and listen to what my heart says that's actually god speaking to me through my heart and always within that's always where the answers are and that's always where it lies you know and it's a matter of kind of just figuring it out as you go along be open to receive and then just going with the flow of life in the way that's best for you and like you said i love that you said you were saying it very consciously i was you said i was being unkind to myself and i think it's important for us to give ourselves a break mm. we're gonna make mistakes yes. we're gonna you know we're gonna do things wrong or we're not gonna do it perfectly and what is perfection aslan yeah. uh, and i think it's part of the learning process is to allow yourself to make mistakes and to be kinder to yourself when you do uh, because mafish haigas my perfect i hear it all the time how can i be a good mom how can i be a perfect mom how can i do the right thing how can i how can i make sure i don't uh, traumatize my child how, mm. there is you and there's the best you can do. Yeah. And right now in that specific moment, if you're doing your best, you're doing great. Yeah. So how do you navigate uh, parent guilt on that note? Parent <laughs> guilt. Ah. How do you, I mean, I'm sure you still kind of up and down deal with of it. Of course, I struggle with it. Mm -hmm. um, how do you then, so because you're doing the best you can, how do you deal with that as a parent? Because again, you're doing this for the first time. You don't know what the right thing to do is. Yeah. How do you differentiate between I actually, I genuinely am not doing enough because I could, I should be doing more. And this is just parent guilt and I, I am doing enough mm. and I need to give myself a break. And right now is the time mm. to take care of myself and, you know, so on and so forth. How do you do that? How do you differentiate in your brain? I think, I'm, I think every parent is constantly working on parent guilt. I don't think a parent has, you know, can, can just graduate from saying I'm no longer ever feeling guilty. I know my mother in her 60s is still feeling <laughs> guilty. <laughs> Um, I, I think one way I like to uh, work around parent guilt is to remind myself that feeling guilty on its own means that I'm a good parent. Okay. Feeling like I'm not doing enough is usually a good, um, a good factor to help us determine that we are trying to do enough. Yeah. Um, so it always that's a good grounding statement I like to tell myself. Like once you, you, you know, you're feeling guilty because you know that you want to do more, which already means that you're probably doing a lot. That like, that lets 90 people off the hook. And like 90% oh, exactly. of the people can relax. Yeah. <laughs> uh, something else that I've recently learned, and then I'm so happy that I'm very verbal about this with my kids because then I'm seeing it, seeing it resonate onto them mm. is I'm really verbal about needing my space and my time and doing my thing. So I'm really verbal about 
listen guys, I love you so much and I would love to spend every waking minute with you guys. <laughs> but sometimes I need me time to calm myself down, to go back and ground myself, to feel like I'm getting my energy back so that I can come back and continue to give you what I love to give you, which is all my love. Yeah. I We've created this, <laughs> this word in our house where, okay, uh, I need some me time or I need some unwinding time. So we call it me time or unwinding time. So some, And so every single member of the family, and I started it with me, um, goes into their space and they do what they need to do in their unwinding time. Your kids use it My well. kids, yeah. So Amazing. Actually, the other day, we, we were out at this really big event and then my daughter goes to my son saying, hey, Tico, when we go back home, do you want to play with me and uh, with this new toy that they just bought? And he's like, no, I think I need to go back home. I need some unwinding time. <laughs> and I look at him like, how good for you yes. he's he's nine years old oh yeah God. and 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 she and my daughter six years old she does the same too and and i think that's a really good asset to to teach to our kids now to learn to listen to themselves listen to their body uh, know certain tools to help them to re-energize or to calm themselves down regulate their nervous system and you guys have to respect that too right like you and you 100%. and megan you have to like oh. Okay, like Tico needs his unwinding yeah, Tico, time, like you can't... Yeah, it. yesterday when he was past his bedtime, I want to go like, oh, he has to sleep, you know? <laughs> and he's like, what he's doing is unwinding time. <laughs> nobody, nobody interfere with his unwinding time. And so, yeah, he just sits and he reads a book, masalan, or... That's amazing. Yeah. I think because like, I remember like with my parents, of course I love them. Again, yeah. doing the best they can with the dogs. They know all that too. I feel like I have to introduce them more. Well, I just feel like we have to say that. <laughs> Um, what I feel like I, a lot of times, and I tell them this now, I say, you know, like all I wanted to, at the time as like this kid that was growing up trying to figure out like what's going on with my body and my mind and all of that. I just wanted to feel like, even if you're going to say no to something like that, you get it, mm. like that you understand that you understand my feeling yeah. and then just say no to me and I'll do it happily. But when you dismiss that feeling or dismiss the thing that I say I need and then you go and do whatever you want. That also that ends up feeling like you're not, you don't mm -hmm. see me as a kid, you yeah. know? Like, and I remember, I can say this as an adult, like, I just feel like I need to be seen, you yeah. know? And that's essentially, I think, what every human being yeah. wants, you know? And so, like, it's really interesting that you would say that because, like, as you're saying, okay, I'm going to need my unwinding time, I have to then respect that my kids need that as well. A hundred percent. And if I'm going to put a rule, then I have to it also... Applies, yeah. yeah. Because it's, like, how you govern everything in life right and i and i think there's a there's a certain concept that i think really helped me once i understood it with the way i parents my kids is that just because i am validating an emotion doesn't necessarily mean that i agree with why they are feeling what they're feeling mm. i mean and 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 so that's and a lot of people say but you know, she shouldn't be crying. I just got her 10 toys. Why is she crying that she didn't get that one pink pony that she wanted? After? <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, I get it. But if she's feeling sad, she has every right to have that feeling. Doesn't necessarily mean that we need to agree with that emotion. But it does mean that we can validate that feeling and then help her realize mm. and then start using logic and reasoning after we validated that emotion how else we can navigate that situation. Okay. Um, are there times where you felt like you really messed up as a parent? Like you did something you really shouldn't have done? Oh my God, a lot of times. Which one? <laughs> like, oh my is God, there a something you remember that like stood out for you? And then what did you do about it? Like, how do you then, what do you do with your kid after, you know? You know, it's funny you ask that because just a few days ago, I was asking my son, <clears throat> we were out and there was a mom shouting to, uh, at her son. And then I looked at him and I s asked him, Tico, did I ever s like scream at you like that? Did I ever, you know, use my hands or did I? And, he, and he's like, yeah, I think you did once. And the funny thing is that I don't remember it. Mm. And he's like, yeah, I remember there was a time you really screamed at me. And it was, and I remember it really, really, really well. And uh, he basically will say, you lost your cool. <laughs> you totally flipped out. <laughs> And then I asked him to remind me, and and yeah, and then like I remembered, yeah, there was a time I totally uh, flipped my switch, and the reason behind it at the time, after he made me remember the the exact situation, was a hundred percent me. Mm. A hundred, I flipped my switch on 
the smallest thing ever. I was having a bad day. I was going through a lot. I was not able to regulate myself as I should have done. Mm. And I totally lost my cool with him. Um, he was eating cereal and then he dropped it on the floor. I yeah, got something it just was like really, it was really, it was really when I, you know, when I come to think about it, it was so silly. Like you're like, now that I'm calm, what was I thinking? <laughs> it was so silly, but I remember I shouted and, uh, and, and he remembers it till today. Mm. And I remember, and, and I think that's something we, I mean, if I'm not only speaking about myself, we as parents, if I yeah. can generalize that, we're not robots. We're made to feel and we have to feel all emotions. Yeah. And it's natural for us to sometimes, a lot of the times, not be able to control every single emotion. Yeah. And so I don't think it's fair for us to ever expect to never lose our our cool or never flip our switch in front of our kids. It's bound to happen. It, yeah. ha it will happen. Yeah. I think what's more important is how do we then deal with that situation after we calm down? Yeah. What is it that we say to our kids? And we need to, we have to, we must apologize. Mm. They need to know that's not okay. Mm. They need to know that's not okay so that they don't act that way. They need to know that's not okay so that they don't ex expect that behavior from other people around them. Mm. They need to know that's not okay so that they can respect themselves enough to, so that if somebody else around them shouts, they can stop that and say, you're not allowed to talk to me like that. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, so we ha I apologized. Mm. And then I gave them this, uh, this like, a, they, they can, this kind of like a get out of jail free cards. Yep. Where I'm like, next time I shout, you call me out yeah. on it, okay? You tell me, mom, you're, you're shouting, that's not okay. And you tell me that. And they do. And sometimes when they do that, it just, you know, sometimes you're in this trance and they just help me to like, oh my God, yes, 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 I am. You're right. Okay, I need to calm down. I'm going to go calm down. And I think us modeling that too is also really important for them because then they learn when they get angry and I call them out for it, yeah. they too need to go and calm down. Yeah, yeah of course. Well, those are really interesting tools to use. I, start, I feel like in general, our emotions obviously are going to get all over the place and we haven't really learned how to navigate it. We start learning as adults mm -hmm. how <laughs> to navigate our emotions. But you're teaching your kids as they grow up, right? Um, as you're going through this journey of like being a mom, having kids, having a husband and a family, has having kids maybe more probably at the beginning than now affected your relationship with your husband? And then... Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you how do you do how do you deal with that? How do you navigate it? Like, what are things people can do? So let's start off. I think with has it affected your relationship with your husband? Uh, the first few months of having each child, it it has mm. it definitely has, because um, I think actually no, I'll take that back. I think specifically the first year. Okay. I think the second time around, we knew what to expect, and we were we we had more tools and more awareness as to how to handle it. Mm. So I think the hardest the hardest year was the first year, mm. and that's when it really um, hit us. And also, and and in my specific situation, it's because I gave birth very right after I gave I uh, got married. Mm. So technically, we were still newlyweds. You know, we, it hasn't been a year and we've already became parents and we're still, we're 22. <laughs> we're still getting to know each other. So we're still growing. We're still learning together. Um, and also that when you get married, there's like this adjustment period to begin with. Mm -hmm. Like you and him are yes. still kind of like learning more about out. each other and figuring out, okay, should we fight this way? Yeah. Should we fight that way? <laughs> Which one works best? Um... So yeah, I think it was a it was a hard period of time, and then obviously we passed. It eventually passes, uh, but then I think we had to communicate a lot okay. because yeah. our needs at the time were very different. Mm. Um, I think I I I needed to pause and put other people's needs before mine for a certain period, mm. and I think for him his needs were pretty much similar as he was always, you know, verbal and vocal about it. So then it just, it just okay, where do we meet in the middle mm. to, to, or when do we just need to understand that this is where you're at now, yeah. this is where I am now, and then we're going to eventually 
cross to the other side. Yeah, because I feel like a really big part of having like a healthy family is learning to communicate mm. and to resolve conflict in like a healthy manner. Yeah. I think that's something also most of us didn't learn how to do. And it's something I learned later on in life. And it's like, even through all of the relationships that I was in before meeting Hussein, like I it was never part of my world about how do you resolve conflict in a healthy manner? Like it's something I learned to do. Yeah with Hussein mm. but because of also the kind of person he was and because I also was a, I was personally a bit older like when I got married I was 32 and so like it was very important for me to say like okay I made all these mistakes like here's what I know is this absolutely essential and I know that for marriages to last and last in a beautiful way one of the most essential things is to learn how to communicate well mm -hmm. and learn how to communicate our needs mm -hmm. well um, and then I assume like when you then have kids if you're already able to learn learning how to communicate with each other in a healthy manner and be able to express what you need as opposed to keeping quiet, stuffing it down and then exploring yes. later on. Yes. Um, I assume then within that context it'll help a lot. Yes. So what do you suggest people do? Like now I'm asking, I mean the psychologist, <laughs> <laughs> what do you suggest, you know, married couples do? Because you you inject a child in there with lots of different needs. I see a lot of the times like moms end up neglecting themselves and neglecting their husbands because they're taking care of the kids and that'll cause a lot of tension. So what would be, I mean, I know there's no one right way to do yeah. this, but what are the things that could help? Um, I think before having children, if that's still an option, it's important to just talk about who's going to be helping out and what. Mm. And I think that's... Having the, a practical conversation. Yeah, I think having that, because mm. at the end of the day, it, does, it, it sometimes boils down to you know, you need to help each other physically with whatever tasks that needs to be done for the baby. I know it's a very small, um, a very small thing to consider, but it actually it does a lot when you both know what to expect. Because, because sometimes you know, one partner will say, "Listen, I'm not willing to help out an X, but I'm a hundred percent there for you in Y." Mm. And so it just the because the expectations there. Mm. When when you're in that situation, you're not going to be thinking the narrative won't be like, oh, I'm alone. My partner isn't helping me in X at all. So it just it, it gives you a bit of a perspective. And sometimes <clears throat> your partner will be saying, you know, I, I'm with you all the way. And mm -hmm. sometimes it'd be like, no, I'm going to be taking the night shifts. You sleep at night and I'm going to be taking night shifts and you take morning. Sh you know, I think it's this conversation uh, is important to have. Yeah. It helps you know what to expect. Yeah. And when you know what to expect, you're more likely to accept yeah. the situation. Um, I think having that healthy dialogue of um, communicating your needs and how you feel yeah. and maybe practicing it just as you and I did it actually before considering yeah. having kids is, yeah. a, good, uh, yeah. is a good way to practice. Learning to express how you feel. Yeah. Even though it sounds so basic, I feel like most people don't know how to do that. And I feel like a lot of people struggle to learn how to do that because yeah. We were never taught to process our own feelings, let alone, let alone just share it with other people. You know, it's something that actually I found very interesting uh, that has helped me personally label my feelings. And then it has helped me help the kids label their feelings. So a lot of the times when we come to label a feeling, we end up saying a thought. So I said it today, actually. So you said, how did you feel? I said, um, I, I felt alone, okay? Mm -hmm. Alone is not a feeling. Alone is an action. We're not a lot. A lot of us is okay. it's lonely is the feeling. So actually, something that I found super interesting that it was helpful for myself and helpful when it came to talking about emotions with my children, is that we tend to label our emotions as a thought. So when we come to say how we feel, we end up saying things like, um, "I feel like I was the only one experiencing what I was experiencing," versus saying. I felt lonely. Mm. Emotions are always one word. Okay. And the thought is a process. It's a full sentence. Okay. So this helped me really differentiate between and, and experience and learn how to say how I felt versus what I was thinking. Okay. And so when it came to my kids and I'm helping them realize, I'm helping them learn about their emotions, I'd ask them, what are you feeling? And then they'll sometimes say a thought and I'll say, that's what you're thinking. Let's stick to one word. Okay, very interesting. So can you give me like for an example, like 
other than lonely and alone, like what other examples like do you find people? Because I'm still trying to, this is so interesting because I've never thought about it in that way because a lot of the times we all get jumbled up inside of our brain, which is a lot of where a lot of our problems come from. So like, for example, what would a mom have a difficult time kind of like verbalizing and separating between emotions and the way she, what she says? Um, so I, th one of the things that I hear a lot is moms saying, um, I feel like I'm not getting the support that I need. Okay. When her answer, her, her emotion could be, I want to feel connected. I want mm. to feel supported. I want to feel um, validated. Mm. So these are the feelings versus the thought process. Okay. Very interesting because we've never really learned to separate between the two. And I think, I think as well, when we don't learn how to communicate what we need, we won't get what we need, mm -hmm. which is where most of the frustration comes from. And I think a part of that is also not understanding that it's okay to feel, to be vulnerable with people and say how we're feeling and request how we're feeling. I remember a couple of days ago, and I think I actually messaged you. I loved this thing that you posted about this little kid that was just expressing how, I think it was she was feeling mm -hmm. and you were like I really, I really wish adults could like get into a yeah. space you know do you feel like learning to be vulnerable makes you a better parent like understanding what vulnerability really is and then learning to do that with your children and with your husband can make you a better parent actually that's a really good question because I think part of the conditioning that we've been taught is that for you to be a good parent you need to have all the right answers you need to show authority i need to always be right mm. and mm. and because of that i feel like a lot of parents find it difficult when i ask them to apologize to their child they go what me apologize to him i'm the parents here you know <laughs> like i'm the one with the authority they should be respecting me and so we've mm. completely we we we've, we've merged uh, or we've we've mixed respect and authority together yeah. when they're completely not related. Yeah. Your child can 100% respect you without you, you needing to be that um, authoritative with him. Mm. Uh, they can respect you with love, they can respect you with compassion, with empathy, yeah. but you don't have to demand, you don't have to enforce or tell them what they need to do. And um, and I think that's once we come to that realization, it allows us to be more ourselves. It allows us to be more vulnerable. It allows us to be more open. It allows us to say things like, you know what, buddy, I made a mistake and I'm sorry. Mm. It allows us to let them learn from us as well. We're yeah. constantly modeling to our kids how they should uh, be behaving, what they should be saying, how they should be acting. So when they see that it's okay to make mistakes, it's okay to say I'm sorry, it's okay to be uh, your vulnerable self out in the open world, they too will follow. Why do you think us as adults were so scared of being vulnerable? I think we've been conditioned that vulnerability is weakness mm. from a very young age. I think we also, we don't see it, we don't know it. Mm. And so when we feel it, 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 it to us feels like this is really alien and this is not something that I should be experiencing. And the fact that I'm experiencing it only means that I am not a strong enough person. Yeah. I think I realized as well, like with this idea of vulnerability, we are scared that if I am vulnerable with like you, Amina, and I say how I'm feeling, and then you don't receive it well, or you block it, or you make fun of it, I then put myself in a position of weakness to be then made fun of or bullied or have that not received well and then it's affected me. And I think I also personally realized, I think vulnerability is a superpower is what I personally believe. And then I realized like, I can choose to be vulnerable with you. How you choose to receive that, that's you. That's about mm -hmm. you and that's not about me. Mm -hmm. Like You can't affect who I am as a person because you chose to receive and respond to something I've said to you in maybe an inappropriate or a mean or a hostile manner that has nothing to do with that. My ability to be, ability to be vulnerable is my own ability to be honest with myself and mm -hmm. with you and your 
response to me is equally the same. It's your own ability to be vulnerable or not, and your own ability to be honest with me or not. And that's my behavior is a testament to my character. Yours is yours, and you ca- you cannot affect me in that way. I think we're also scared of what someone's reaction will, how someone's reaction will impact us and change who we are. Mm. I never understood that. Mm. And I think it's because also sometimes we give them that power to define who we are. And once you strip yourself or strip them from that power, Mm -hmm. like you said, they don't get to dictate how they, how my story is told. Mm -hmm. My vulnerable story is said, Mm -hmm. this is my story and this is my superpower. And I'm not going to have their... Um, their opinions affect me. We yeah. strip them from that power, yeah. and and so it becomes it becomes ours. And I think as well, like when you then take this idea of vulnerability, and you have moments of vulnerability with your children, even though your child may you know doesn't take it well or throws a tantrum or whatever, it doesn't take away from the fact that you did the correct thing. You were honest and you were vulnerable with them. Mm-hmm. I think with time, then they'll learn to respond to you in that same manner. Because a lot of time, I see parents like they'll have those kinds of well, I tried and it didn't work, and you know he threw a tantrum, and so I'm just going to yell from next time because yeah. it just didn't work. But it's like a thing of practicing to learn to do that because that's about who you are. Yeah. And if you can at every moment as much as possible be the kind of human being that you intend to consciously want to be, it will help us then get into a space where our entire ecosystem, you've designed how you want your relationships to be with each other. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very, very important. Um, Are there rituals that you have every day that you do for yourself to be able Mm. to give back to yourself so that you can be a better mom, better wife, better human being, better psychologist for your clients? So I'm not really good at this. My husband is. I'm not. <laughs> but I try. Uh, something that does help uh, a lot for me is to kind of try to wake up before the kids wake up. Just five minutes. All I need is five minutes in the morning to drink my coffee in silence. <laughs> uh, it really helps me. Um, something recently, a new habit that I'm trying to integrate into my morning routine is to get out into the sunlight for at least 10 to 20 minutes as soon as I wake up. So important. This makes a huge, huge difference for the, for the rest of my day. Yeah. And it, it impacts me. And sunlight, is imp- I, I've noticed recently, it makes it, it it's important to me. Yeah, me too. <clears throat> so um, I've learned, even in sometimes I just sit in the balcony and just let the sun soak my skin. <laughs> like I don't necessarily need to uh, be walking in the sun or doing a, like an activity in the sun, just... Having the sun, you know, sunlight hit my skin. Just penetrate. Yeah. Like. <laughs> um, it's, it's something I love to do. Um, and then I get, uh, after the kids sleep, I get some me time. Okay. My unwinding time, okay. uh, which they know of. Um, I like to read and learn and study a lot. And, that's, and the kids now know that this is my way of unwinding. So because of my profession, I need to continuously be learning and training so I'll sometimes have to travel for a small bit and come back I'll have to uh, be in like a three-day uh, conference and the kids don't see me and then come back okay. so um, they know this is my way of also taking care of myself mm. that's amazing okay so I want to end by doing something I'm going to uh, begin sentences you know, right. I need to finish the sentences okay Okay. Like one of those fast... Uh... No, no, no. Oh, okay. You can take your time and respond. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, I know we talked about this already, but I want you to say what you think it is, okay? A good mother is... Herself. I deserve... Hmm. I feel like I would say happiness, but then what is happiness? So I'm not sure if the answer should be happiness or the answer should be I deserve to be true to myself. Um, motherhood taught me. Motherhood taught me that I don't know everything mm. and that um, actually my children are my teachers. Mm. I'm learning so much through them mm-hmm. and, um, and that And that it's a beautiful thing to um, feel like you have pieces of you, uh, pieces of your heart, 
um, growing and learning and evolving out into the world. The world needs? More hugs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the world needs. The world needs more vulnerability. Yeah. yeah, I feel like I'd say that after this talk, especially. I am ready to forgive. Well, I wasn't expecting that one. <laughs> so I would say I generally have worked a lot on myself and forgiven people uh, around me, but I think more work needs to be done on myself. So I'm ready to forgive myself. Mm. Okay. I love myself when? I'll go back to and say this again. I love myself when I'm really my true authentic self mm -hmm. and not what the world taught me to be. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. And I resonate with that. And I totally agree with yeah. that. Amina, thank you so much. Thank you. This was this amazing. amazing. It was like a very, I learned so much actually just by sitting oh, here with wow. you. And that I honestly, like I've talked to you tons of times before. I think we didn't really get a chance to sit here and talk about this in this capacity. Mm. And thank you for pouring your heart out. This was incredible. Thank you. Thank, thank you for, for, you know, navigating the questions in a way that I would. Um, and I, I, it felt so natural. And uh, and I'm, I've, I've, my heart feels so full. Me too. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs>